Carol Kaplan, um, been in New Orleans all my life, uh, did one minor stint out in California when my ex was in the service. Um, I'm a realtor with Ladder and Bloom, been doing this for over 25 years now, and uh, been here all my life. So you were born in New Orleans? I was born in New Orleans. Actually, you know, I'm a real estate agent. The house across the street came for sale yesterday. And my friend that was born in that house, and, I, and we were teeter-totter buddies, and I brought her back to see the house, and, and I wrote her last night. She wrote me and thanked me so much. And I wrote her back, and I said, not many people can dance together for 70 years. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about growing up in New Orleans. What was your experience growing up here? Well, I grew up uptown. I've, I've moved a whole 10 blocks away, but um, I, I did take a minor marital stint out in Metairie. Um, but, but I grew up, grew up very close to where I am now, um, uptown, close to the park. Park was a big part of my life. Um, went to school uptown. Did, my parents did want me to go to Newcomb here, and I went to LSU in Baton Rouge. I just didn't, I wanted to get away. Um, and then came back here and worked with IBM. And what did you do for IBM? I was a systems engineer. You were, whoa. Whoa, huh? Yeah. <laughs> go Carol. Yeah. I was a math major up at LSU, and, which doesn't matter. It was, it was more, they gave a, a logic test. So um, are you a math major too? Good. Go for it. <laughs> go for it. And, um, but the, the test to, to pre-interview for IBM was strictly a logic test. And so you, when you came back here and you were working for IBM, you had a family? I got married from here and then um, thanks to Nixon and his first troop pullout, we had three days to get to California and report. So um, we, we were supposed to have a month and a half, but um, we had three days to get to California report. So I lived in California for, God, I think he had about seven months left on his duty because he had been in Nam. And then we came back. He, he, I wanted to stay in California, actually, and he wanted to come back here and do a residency. Um, the, the LSU residency, residency program medical is really top-notch. You get to, to do hands-on by your sophomore year in med school, and then residency is total. You're, you're number one. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit, did you have children? Two boys, two boys. And you raised them here? Raised them here. And are they still here? Uh, one is here and one is in um, is at Arizona State. Oh, cool. He's a professor at Arizona State. What does he teach? Uh, uh, bioengineering. Oh my goodness. Bioengineering. Okay. <laughs> He's a chemical engineer teaching bioengineering. Very cool. So tell me, uh, what is life like in New Orleans? I mean, in your experience, what is it that makes New Orleans New Orleans? It's, it's, it's an intangible that makes New Orleans New Orleans. Um, I have a wonderful something that I got over the internet that I'll have to send you, but um, it, it, it's, it's a mixture of work and play. It's not that we don't work, because we work very hard, but we play very hard too. And there's, um, there's a real congeniality here. Um, that's, that's what people come and visit and they stay. Uh, a lot of Maroney right now is Brooklyn, New York, that, that has come to stay. And um, it's, it's, it's just a community. So tell me a little bit, if you don't mind, about your experiences around Katrina. I was at the beach. My kid, I was in Alabama. And uh, I, I mean, I had gone for vacation, and I, I had the condo for a week and a half, and my kids were in Destin running... Um, a triathlon. My son runs the triathlon and the rest of the family. He has two kids and his wife and two kids were over there. So we had a, you know, about five bathing suits between us and I had four noodles with me and two beach chairs and um, that's, what, that's what I had. And he got kicked out. Katrina started actually down around the bend in Florida. It was supposed to hit um, Apalachicola. So if you look at a map and want to point that out, was supposed to hit Apalachicola. Well, with hurricanes, it just kept moving and moving. So Destin was the next place. My son got kicked out of his condo. So he called me, Mom, can we come over to yours? So, okay, I said, fine. So I went downstairs, I re-upped for the rest of the week because I knew I could have it till Thursday. 
went downstairs, signed up. By the time I got back upstairs, big announcement, all non-owner tenants had to leave. And even though I was a guest of the owner, because I asked, they said, no, you have, to, you have to leave. So I called them and they said, well, what do we do now? I said, well, why don't you meet me at the Dairy Queen up in Foley, which was, was the highway exit. I said, I have to pack my car and I know you were already in your car. Um, I, said, I said, let's meet up at, at the Dairy Queen. So he said, he said, where are we going? And I said, why don't we go to Disney World? <laughs> it had already passed there. You know, we had, we had the whole family, you know, three generations. And um, he, he's not quite as wild as I am. Uh, so, so he had already made plans to go visit the sister-in-law in Atlanta. So we went up there. And so did you, did you have any damage from Katrina? Yeah, he, he's a doctor, the, the son that's here, and he got in on a medical evac here. And, I mean, the, 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 people don't understand, you know, like we were at the beach, so we had nothing. We had literally nothing. His medical records were in his house. We don't know what happened to his house. His Louisiana medical records are in the basement on Camp Street, which we figure are flooded, which were. Um, he had no credentials to be a doctor. So even with all the, um, the evac that was done up to Baton Rouge, he couldn't work because he had nothing to say he was a doctor. He had a driver's license, and, and his driver's license doesn't say MD. So anyway, so, so he and I went back to Baton Rouge. His wife and kids went to Seattle because we were told we weren't going to get back in the city for six months. It, you know, we're a bowl and, and it wasn't going to drain. So, like I said, we, we, and he, he, he was like, oh, God, there's a lot of Civil War places we're going to pass, you know, from Atlanta. I said, we have all the time in the world. You pick where you want to go and we'll stop. And, oh, no, I'm going to go to Baton Rouge. Okay, so we went to Baton Rouge. I called my friend. I said, you know, you said if I ever need anything, call you. So they put me up and one of the, one of her kids, grown kids, because Craig was a grown man at the time, stayed at the, at the daughter's house. And, and we operated out of there. Anyway, he got in with a medical evac after 10 days and was able to talk to East Jefferson and, and they knew he was a doctor, so they, you know, he, he was working there. Uh, but he got to my house and he said, Ma, you know where the doorknob is? And I said, yeah, I know where the doorknob is. He said, I can see it. So that was, that was how much water I had in my house. And then uh, by the time I got home, which was probably several weeks later, I can't remember how long, the boats had come down the street as rescue. So, so the waves came in my house and even stuff that was high was turned over. So there was nothing. There was nothing left downstairs. And, and you lived uptown? I lived uptown, yes. Oh, okay. I lived right across from Tulane University, from the dorms. Oh, okay. And my cat was there by himself. Uh, he, went, he went in, he tried to rescue the cat, and some helicopter must have seen, he had to swim to my house, you know, and uh, with the cat food above his head. And he, some guys went with him, and some helicopter must have seen them. So the helicopter comes over. So the cat hears the helicopter, wasn't about to leave that house. Then, so he gets the cat all calmed down, you know, and he goes out, the helicopter must have wired one of those airboats, and here's the airboat coming down Calhoun Street to pick, you know, see if, because people just stayed out on their porch and waved people down. I mean, there were people that didn't leave, which probably I would have been one of them, um, had I not already been at the Gulf Coast. So anyway, so, so that scared the cat, so he, he, he just opened the bag of food, he got, a, he got out a... Um, a, a salad bowl and just filled it with water and the cat did fine. A little mad at me when I got home, but. <laughs> so um, how long did it take you to get back home? He brought me in on some of his trips. Um, I want to say in the neighborhood of six weeks-ish. And every time I came in, I just filled the back of the car with Clorox, not knowing that you had to um, dilute it. And I mean, I just, all downstairs, I just poured Clorox. And I did keep the mold down, so it, it worked. Good. Um, I didn't get, I, I, I was making trips back and forth from Baton Rouge. There was a seven o'clock curfew, so you had to be out of here. And when I tell you there was not a light, there was not a light, there was no potable water. I took a shower anyway. Um, I couldn't get back in my car the way I was, because um, I'd been working all day. Um, but, but, it, 
in, in a, a, a black city with no stoplights, with no lights, where you used to some form of, it, the, the whole thing was an experience. Did you consider not coming back? I, I think I left my options open. I went to my, my Arizona State son lives in, in Scottsdale, so he was kind and I went out there twice. He, football game, um, one was the LSU football game that got moved just like the South Carolina game got moved last week back here. Um, I went out for that game and then um, Craig and I, I guess went out for the Southern Cal game. So I had one kid dressed Southern Cal, one kid dressed Arizona State, and I just brought my LSU clothes back out there. And people were going, well, we played you two weeks ago. And I said, yeah, I know, just, just don't worry about it. But anyway, so I, my, my Arizona son um, helped me look at condos out there and I, would just, I just got queasy. And then um, I went to camp for 10 years in North Carolina and have kept up with all those people. And I go to, Carolina, I go to North Carolina in the mountains probably once a year. And so I went up there and I looked around and I was just like, oh, please God, let this, let, let this water subside. I'm going home. So um, would you tell us a little bit about the neighborhoods in New Orleans? Lots of people know about New Orleans, but they don't actually know beyond the French Quarter or the Garden District. They've heard those areas and they think about that and that's sort of the vision they have. But I remember when I was looking for, I came over from Lafayette looking for a house, and you mm -hmm. said, well, what do you like to do? Yeah. That was the first question you asked me, uh, you know, when I said. And did I also tell you that, that, that I would drive you around and you, you were going to feel where you wanted to live? You did, and I would like you, if you would, to kind of explain those neighborhoods to people who might see your interview and get a sense of them. It's, I, I still say the same thing. You're going to feel where you want to live. And I, I took a man who wanted, he taught at the university, and I took him around, and just as an example, and I showed him, I didn't tell him where I lived, showed him a house about three blocks up from me, and he looked at me and he said, why would anybody want to live here? I said, oh, okay, well, this in your neighborhood, is it? So it, it's, I live in a university area, I live with students, uh, I'm single, I can come home anytime of the night and there are always kids out. I feel very comfortable. Um, a lot of people don't like the commotion of the kids. Uh, the, the, the sliver by the river, what they call the area that didn't flood is, is, is a higher priced area and the people there just you know really like it. Um, Gentilly, where you live, is definitely on the move, very much on the move. Um, a neighborly residential area. Um, you know, a lot, some artsy, um, of course, French Quarter, and then you, behind the French Quarter is, is Maroney, and, and that's another artsy community. Behind there is Bywater, and a lot of lofts and condos there. A lot of Brooklyn has moved in. A lot of shotgun, shotgun cottages are ones that, that have a door, and you could look straight through to the back door. Um, a lot of shot, redone shotguns in the Bywater. Uh, the, the upper ninth and the lower ninth by the canal uh, got a big hit, a big hit. And unfortunately, there was a lot of um, contractor fraud there because the people, they, we'll go into that later. Every neighborhood, the, the neighbors love each other and people don't want to move anywhere else. And it, it's really true. I remember mm -hmm. friends of mine who grew up here and always talked about where you at. Yeah, where you at? <laughs> and where'd you go to high school? Um, and then in Gentilly, it was it was a whole different. It was making groceries. Yeah, and yeah. Pass by, there was a lot of Cajun and Gentilly. How's your mom and them? How's your mom and them? Yeah. Um, a very different sort of. Just as you go through the neighborhood, mm -hmm. it's always interesting. But it's very out outside friendly. Um, even, even in this television gaming world, people still are outside a lot. Um, the city park area, oh my God, city park is just blossomed in that area and, and, and all the young people congregate there. I'm, so, I'm talking about the 30s, 20s, 30, 40 professionals. So tell us a little bit about um, post-Katrina. 
Um, are there differences in New Orleans that you see pre and post Katrina? I am a hoarder. Um, I had a bunch of newspapers and magazines from before Katrina. And I would say about six years after the storm, I pulled them out and I'm looking at them and, you know, Joe Brown crossed the street. And we were just a real staid society, I guess, to say. You know, everybody was, was in, in their own neighborhoods, but there was, there was no thought about advancement too much. Not, not, not people or job advancement, but even doing anything culturally in the city. Now it's unbelievable. I mean, there, we have blossomed. We have blossomed. We're a whole new world. Can you describe some, like, two or three specific ways in which you think New Orleans has blossomed? What has been addressed? Ooh, everything's been addressed. Everything's been addressed. But um, we have more restaurants now than we had before the storm. Um, certainly lots of cultural stuff. Uh, you, have, you have the UNO Arena. You have the, well, I'll call it the blender, but whatever, Smoothie Center. The Smoothie Center next to the Dome. Then you have the Dome for the really big events. A um, lot of smaller venues. Le Petite is blossoming. Uh, Broadway Across America is now in, in the redone Sanger Theater. Orpheum just opened for the symphony. Every, everything was at the Mahalia Jackson after the storm. And unfortunately, the municipal auditorium has not been touched. Um, wonderful parks. I mean, we have Audubon Park. We have City Park. We have Lafreniere Park. We have um, Armstrong Park downtown. Jazz Fest is like unbelievably big. French Quarter Fest is free. And it's, it's from Bourbon Street all the way on the levee, all the way on the levee. Audubon Institute now, um, besides the zoo facility, which is all redone, they have the aquarium, which is on the levee. And Ida Komar sculptures are in front of the aquarium. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's a lot of pride, a lot of pride. Mm -hmm. Are there issues that you still see um, or issues that you think have developed as a result of Katrina? Ooh, I see mostly only good. I mean, unfortunately, there was contractor fraud. There was contractor fraud at my house. I called, I screamed, I was, I was berserk. The, the guy, uh, the, the contractor, okay, first of all, when money was given from FEMA, FEMA, there was an original discussion about whether you had to file a form and send it to Baton Rouge to the government and in order to be allotted X number of dollars for this work, X number. And Governor Blanco at the time, and, and she was probably right, but unfortunately some people survived it, some people didn't. Um, she said, she said there was no way to get a piece of paper for every time you were putting a toilet in or, you know, a basin in or whatever. So, so you had to pay your contract on your own. Some people, and, and these homes were passed down from, from family, to, you know, member to family member, family, especially out, out in, in the Ninth Ward. Um, they had no idea working with a contractor. Contractor came and said, give me your FEMA money. I promise to fix your house. They were out of there. Took, took the check and ran. Um, same thing happened uptown. We just had a little more fortitude to fight it. Um, and it, it was very frustrating. It, the, my contractor finally said, Carol, if you just go fix your house, don't worry about paying me anymore. You know, <laughs> I brought him in. I said, look that way. And you could see my front door. It was carved crooked. And so the sun was just beaming in. But, but they, the, the contractors, the, the Hispanic workers in particular, would stand in front of the Home Depots and the Lowe's and contractors would go pick them up. They had, they had no credentials at all. So that was, that was and, and they are still around today working, but of course they're 10 years experience now. So we're very fortunate to have them. But originally they were just green. So are there perceptions you wish the general public to understand and or misperceptions you wish to mitigate about rebuilding New Orleans after Yeah, I, I, I wish more were said about 80% of the city flooding. That, that the old city, if you, take, if you take the old city and draw it along the Mississippi, just, just along the Mississippi, um, before we tried to recapture the swamp, the area that's right on the levee survived. 
and didn't flood. 80% of the city, it didn't care whether you were black, white, Hispanic, whoever you were, it flooded. It flooded. And we all were in the same boat. We all were in the exact same boat. Um, so you, you see the pictures of more of the pictures of the ninth and, 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 the, and the lower ninth. It, it wasn't just them. It was 80%. I flooded just like they flooded. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was um, their houses were the old shotguns, like I say. So they were built probably about 1890-ish. They literally were so well built without a computer, without any, you know, anything but, a, but a, a yardstick to measure. These houses were so well built, they floated like boats. They were sometimes two and three blocks away. They, it, was, it, was, it was an amazing sight. But the, the perception that only poor people flooded is ever so wrong, mm -hmm. ever so wrong. Do you, were most of those people able to come back? They're trickling back. They're trickling back. Um, many, many have found wonderful jobs away. Uh, the people of the United States were so wonderful. They took us in. Um, it, it, some of those people were put on a bus, just put, you know, because, because they had nothing. There was nowhere to go. And it wasn't that they didn't have the opportunity to get, to get out of the city. If you saw, the Superdome was not supposed to be open. And it, it was not a place of last rescue. They said, they said, don't come to the Superdome. Do not come to the Superdome. And, and these big sedans were dropping off their relatives at the Superdome. And, of course, they took their cars and went somewhere else. But, but so, so here we had multitudes of people at the Superdome. And then, and then the convention said Superdome flooded, so they had to go somewhere. So they walked to the convention, or swam to the convention center. But... Um, but these, these people had people in cars that dropped them off, and they were long gone and, of course, couldn't get back. So they put these people in buses, and they were bused or flown somewhere, some to Utah, some to Houston, uh, lots of places. And, and many have written stories about they, they, were, they were offered jobs, and they were offered homes, and they've, they flourished. Mm -hmm. So um, a few more questions, and I know we're taking up your time, so I don't want to... Um, just want to make sure it covers something. Um, what would you say characterizes, epitomizes, or symbolizes New Orleans now? Is it the same thing as it's always been? Has it changed at all? Uh, what character? Well, of course, the Saints. Because when we got back in the Dome for that first game, it was it, like the whole city pulled together. We're going to make it. Um, but our music, we are so lucky. We are so lucky. I mean, we, we have music everywhere. Of course, like I say, the Saints, we, and they brought in other teams, but I don't think any, any one team solidifies the city like the Saints. Um, if we win, everybody's happy for a week. If we lose, everybody's unhappy for a week. And so this isn't going to be real happy. Um, but, but anyway, that first game, because it took us a year, LSU, LSU, it took us, I think, four weeks to play our first game in Tiger Stadium. And, of course, those of us that are Tiger fans felt so at home. We played Tennessee. It was wonderful. Um, and Arizona State was wonderful to us. You know, they, they hosted the game just like, just like we did for South Carolina, but it wasn't the same being in Tiger Stadium. And they were using Baton Rouge. All the athletic facilities were being used for triage and helicopter landing. So, so... It, it was going to a much higher cause up there. Um, it took us a year to get back in the dome, and it was it was really a symbol of we're going to make it. And uh, I, I would I would say that there's just a special joie de vie in New Orleans. Um, it's uh, you know whether it's, whether it's the music or the amicability of, of people on the street. It's a good place. All righty. Is there anything in particular you you just want to say? Is there something that you can think of that you would want people to know when they see your interview? Yeah. On the on the on the tenth anniversary on Facebook, I I thanked the nation because they came to our help. Mm -hmm. And and I asked I asked my friends to share it so that more and more people, and and how appreciative we are to everybody in the nation. The people who came down here and worked. 
oh my goodness, they came in multitudes from, from places and, and professional people came to work like dogs cleaning windowsills. It, it, just thank the nation.